you are the co-founder and the uh, creative director of uh, Ninja Theory, and you are currently working on Hellblade, which uh, we can see on the screens to either side. And um, I was going to say, when people ask what you're doing, what you're working on, how do you respond? How do you explain Hellblade to people? Well, <coughs> I mean, there's, there's a couple of aspects to it. One is it's an action-adventure game, fantasy action-adventure game, in a similar vein to the ones we've done before, like Heavenly Sword or Enslaved or DMT. Um, but um, there are two standout parts of this game. One is that we're self-funding this game, so it's, it's, it's the first game that we're funding ourselves. It's a small team of 15 people currently. Uh, it'll probably stay at 15. Um, I think you called it an indie AAA. Yeah, <laughs> independent AAA, for want of a better word, is what we call it. So it's the idea is to create a game that has the production values of AAA games, that looks, you know, looks and sounds great, but um, that has more of the sensibilities and ethos of indie development, which is, or independent film development, which is to find a different angle or a different aspect to it. And in our case, the fantasy in Hellblade is um, different from the usual Tolkien-esque or, uh, I don't know, a, a space marine type thing. But not nothing wrong with those those themes, but they've been wanted to try and find a new, a new angle for fantasy. And in this case, it's about Senua and she suffers from mental, uh, mental, uh, mental health conditions, which means that she sees the world very differently from everyone else uh, around her. And so as a player, you, in you explore her w the world that she lives in through her eyes, and it looks, f and that's where the fantasy element, if you like, comes in. Okay, and if you tell me a little bit about how uh, the character came about and how the idea for the game came about and then developed as you sort of pinned more and more details down. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, want, uh, I mean, we're known for doing sort of like melee type games, sword based games, and it helps to set it in a historical setting. And I thought um, Celtic, being you know being from England, like Celtic culture hasn't been represented very much in games and. I looked into the history of that, and I, and I s came across an article about a, a goddess called Senu. It was Senua. Um, uh, they thought it, her name was Senua, but it turned out to be Senuna. But anyway, I like Senua better. And <laughs> her, her, her tomb was found with an inscription that said something like, um, to Senua, goddess Senua, we willingly fulfilled our vow. And so there's a, lo a, a mystery there. We will never know who she is. And I thought, uh, it sounds like we could create a, a work of fiction around that. Um, so that was appealing. And then I, I did want to make something that was uh, fantasy-based. I like fantasy. Um, but I sort of wanted to find something more grounded than the usual fantasy that you see. And separately to that, I was reading up about... Uh, the mind, creativity. Um, on Reddit in particular, I read up uh, a lot of first-hand experiences of uh, psychosis and schizophrenia. And even just reading about it, uh, I, I started to feel frightened, like frightened about of what people were seeing and how vivid it seemed to be. Um, so I thought it was a, a subject to explore because I don't recall seeing it uh, portrayed very often in video games, at least not in a overt manner. Often you see it in, ho in horror-themed games, but uh, I thought it was, I, like, I like to try and delve into a subject and understand it, and that's what I did, and the more I read, the more I was compelled to make, make her. Okay. Um, when you've been sort of developing the game, you've been working with um, uh, Paul Fletcher, haven't you, from uh, the University of Cambridge, yeah. who's an expert in um, psychosis and uh, related illnesses. And so I was wondering at what point he became involved in the process, how you met him, how I, I think it was welcome that put you in touch with him, or um, at least facilitated. Well, actually, I mean, we, if we... We were put in. Uh, I mean, w w tackling something like uh, mental health is obviously going to be a sensitive issue, and it's a taboo subject. Really, it's still s a subject that affects probably all of us. I would say, um, 
either indirectly or directly. And um, I knew we needed to really do our research. So we got in touch with Paul uh, Fletcher from Cambridge because we're based in Cambridge and um, he does a lot of work with Melt Welcome and he's helped us enormously and through him we've become more and more involved with Welcome. Um, so Welcome gave us a development grant to start with, a small grant so that we could continue working with Paul and um, then we produced a section of the game, a vertical slice, and then we showed that to Welcome and they gave us a co-production award which okay. has opened up a, a, a lot more doors for us. And in the work that you've done with Paul Fletcher, sort of how did how did that develop over time? What did you sort of present at first <coughs> and then how did that get refined? Uh yeah, so I mean, we w it was very early on and we talked to Paul about the premise of the game and Paul's a, um, he's a professor of health neuroscience and a psychiatrist, so he has a lot of experience working with people with that have lived experience. And so it started at the story stage, really, like trying to create a character profile for Senua, how she might have grown up, um, how typical symptoms uh, would, would have developed and how it might have affected her. Um, often it's the stigma attached to the symptoms that make people suffer more than the condition itself. Um, so it just became a, s a collaborative story experience actually. Um, uh, and then we created a vertical slice and a lot of the ideas that Paul had uh, taught us. So he came and talked to the team and told everyone on the team, the artist, uh, um, uh, you know, everyone, about how the mind works, the th latest theory of the mind, and how um, how conditions can put can manifest themselves. And so we incorporated that into a vertical slice, a playthrough, and. So that so I mean I, I brought a video as well that we could show which uh, has sure. it's the opening cutscene of the game, and it incorporates a lot of what we knew back then when we made it a couple of few months ago. Okay. Um, so I'd like to show that first, if you if you please. I'm not turning back. It took months to get here. Well, maybe, but I made my promise. You will die here. We'll all die someday. It's just in dark. I'll continue tomorrow. You're afraid of the dark. I'm being patient. Getting closer to him. I hope so. You sure it's safe here? Yes. Nobody followed us. Be careful. I know. I just wish I could rest a little. In that video, there are a few aspects to um, the symptoms that we've added. Obviously, there's the voices. In particular, a lot of people describe the, the concept of a berated voice, someone that's ever critical. Um, 
people also talk about more kind voices, like uh, almost like a uh, often a um, s like a sympathetic or a more spiritual voice, and this can vary very uh, massively from person to person. But in treating the the game, if you notice, like the the camera is continuous, so it gives you a, a kind of a feeling of like you're a third party observing, a feeling of disassociation, and that's that's done on purpose so that you feel almost like you're part of Senua's mind of observing her. And everything that happens with the sound and the visuals and uh, hallucinations, the things she sees, it's all subjective. So there's no concept of this is what's really happening. Everything that's happening is happening through her eyes and senses. And there's no aha moment at the end or, or at any point that says, oh wait, that's not real, this is real. In truth, everything for Senua is real. And it's that level of confusion that we wanted to portray where you're everything's noisy and uns uncertain and yet she has to still cope with what's going on around her you still have to play the game and figure out the rules of the world and f navigate your way through it as best you can um, and I think that that's yeah I think that's why we've been quite overt about what the game is like uh, the theme of the game is because some people might say well isn't that a spoiler that she's imagining things for example but it's not i don't think because if that's your reality and you can't break free from it it doesn't matter whether somebody tells you it's real or it's not real you still have to deal with it mm. and so you were saying about the dissociative element of the third person camera and i was wondering whether that was because obviously some of the characterization is done through the voices that uh Senna is hearing and interacting with but there's also now this other person, you, sort of controlling her and sort of being in charge of her movements. Is that something that you factored into, I guess, the fiction, or is that more something that you trusted people would take as a game interface um, <coughs> experience? I think it's sort of, it, I think it's implied. Like, um, it's never clear. Like, when the camera's moving around her, often people, when they hear voices, it comes from a place. So they might hear it inside the head, but they could equally hear it in a position in space. So in this case, as the camera moves around, it's moving through different characters. So on her right side, you hear the berater's voice, and as it moves through the, the other side, you hear the other voice. Um, and then it takes on a third form, which is represents her fear, um, the, the thing that she's battling against. So I think... It's not as clear as y the camera is the player. It's it's an, uh, th there's a continuous confusion about whether it's it's more of a feeling that she's being watched or and sometimes she will talk talk to the camera. She will turn and talk to the ca camera, but at that point in time, the observer is a different character. So it, it kind of changes and shifts, and you you might wonder what role the player has in it, uh, yeah. but it's not specifically called out. And you've mentioned specifically uh, about hearing voices and incorporating that uh, part of her experience in the game. But I was wondering, um, you mentioned the vertical slice that you've been showing to people. I was wondering what else people would find in there that touches on um, <laughs> mental illness or that touches on sort of uh, how the external world appears to her and how you've sort of tried to, yeah. to build that <coughs> Yeah, so we tr uh, like there's no HUD in the game. There's no energy bars or inventories or any th anything like that. Um, everything happens within the world space. So a lot of the concepts that you would have in in games, such as keys and doors, are 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 interpreted in a different way. Often, there's um, people can see what they want to see in 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 a, in a sense um or they can become extra attuned to certain elements in the environment um this isn't this isn't by the way just meant people with mental health issues this is this is everyone you know the ability to read the weather or tell the weather from the clouds or 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 the stars i mean our our minds are built to see patterns and be attuned to our environment and some people are more sensitive to our environment than others and so 
part of part of that kind of uh, part of how you unlock new areas or or find new meaning in areas is to become attuned to them in some way, acquire the the skills to become attuned to a certain element and then to see it in, in, in part of the environment. Uh, <coughs> it's quite hard and ambiguous <laughs> to explain, but it's. Um, I think uh, I think when doing our research with Paul and and the service and service users as well with direct lived experience, um, what I, what really struck me more than anything else was, you know, I mean, I, I was probably as a, I was probably quite ignorant to a lot of this subject area before I started this game. Um, I I wasn't even sure whether people saw and heard things literally in front of them. It turns out. They do pe a lot of people do, and I wondered what kind of um, why this can happen in our in our minds. Like, what what is it? What is it about these those people that they can see that? And then I realized that it wasn't those people. It's all of us. The, um, we walk around thinking that everything around us is real, that there is an objective reality, and it, there isn't. And you, it's 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 quite easy to demonstrate this. Um, Scientifically, our eyes are only able to see about one or uh, two percent of the the world in front of us. So, what about the rest? Uh, where does that come from? Because we've got the sense that we're in the reading room, but all I'm seeing right now is your eyes. And so, where does the rest come from? And it turns out um, we don't see literally. We don't see in pictures. We see ob we see colors, shapes, um, depth, orientation. We see movement, we see light, we, uh, we see all kinds of abstract information that then gets assembled into a virtual, into a simulation of, of our world. Um, so if we take that a step further and, and we, we accept that every one of us has a, has a unique sense of reality, there is no un objective sense of reality, then it starts to become easier to understand that in some people, they can be more sensitive to certain things, and that uh, and that um, seeing, hearing a voice, like we all have an inner voice in our head that tells us things, but but uh, if that sensitivity is increased and you can hear that voice literally, it sort of makes sense. We have to be able to simulate the worlds around us in order to exist and function as human beings, um, and. A lot of the conditions we associate with mental health illness are, in fact, natural extensions of our minds themselves. Um, so it's it's that that to me that to me um, made me understand it more than anything else, and made me empathize really with 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 people. Um, it's 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 really hard to listen to someone when they say that they hear a voice 24 hours a day screaming at them, and it's. It's unrelenting, and you think, what would you do in that position? At some point, you wouldn't be able to resist. You would, you would. The stress would be just too overwhelming, and 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 you would try and answer back, and you would try and get out of it. And a lot of people are just dealing with that in the same way that you and I might do. Uh, so, if there's a way to uh, portray some of those things in the game, that that. That's kind of what we want to do. And when you um, you were saying earlier that you've spoken to a lot of these service users and sort of shown them, you've shown them your game as well, or you know where you're at at the moment. I was wondering what the most interesting bits of feedback that you've got have <coughs> been, or perhaps the the most eye-opening or, or unexpected. Yeah. So um, so we met up with about uh, with five service users at. Um, um, Recovery College East in Fulburn, um, in, in Cambridge, and uh, we showed them the vertical slice and played through the game. And I wasn't—I really was not sure what uh, their feedback would be. I mean, they were—they were, they were um, very enthusiastic. Like they were very happy that, um, in some ways, someone was just there to talk to them and listen to them, and not necessarily a doctor or, or, or someone to judge them. It's, it's someone that wants to find out more about, or uh, me and Paul, like we want to find out more about what they see and feel uh, to get that more human, uh, human perspective. And 
I mean, one thing that I learned that I I, I, I didn't expect was um, that it can be very beautiful sometimes, that sometimes what people see can be uh, incredibly exhilarating and, and pretty. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it can be very, very negative, but well, after after we met up with them, what we did was we we took lots of notes and then we started to rapidly try and prototype some of these ideas in Unreal Engine, which is what the engine we're using. And so we went back to the office and, and did that and then invited the service users back, back into our office and showed them what we did, what we created, and, and uh, discussed where things seem to fit and where it seems don't. Now, it's, it's every single person's experience is unique, but there are common threads and there are things that feel, that can feel truthful. And so that's what we're, we, we, we were trying to do. And in fact, I brought another video. That's the only other video <laughs> I brought, but I brought another video, which is um, a compilation of these rapid prototyping tests in Unreal Engine. Uh, a lot of it's based on the service users and some of it's based on um, Professor Paul Fletcher's experience as a psychiatrist. And there's a the mu there's a music track I put on it, as well, uh, which is from the, uh, musician Andy Laplega, who's working on the game. But okay. if we cool. could queue up uh, and run video two, please. As we all know, my heart is so love is so far away. Don't you know how I want to feel deeper? I could never know how you grow all these days are killing me. Now I see deep in me insanity does unfold. I just want to feel, I just want to feel deeper, deeper. I just want to feel, I just want to feel deeper. So the idea now is we've invited a group back to um, further sessions. So what, what we'll do is, we, as we start producing these videos, we'll continue to kind of talk about them. And then as we start developing gameplay sections and scenes in the game, we'll iterate with them as collaborators and try and represent it, uh, I guess you could say, more, more truthfully. Okay. And the other thing that I was wondering was, Obviously, in that video, uh, it felt like it, they were sketches, obviously, sort yes. of rapid prototypes of, of ideas or of things that people had mentioned. Um, but I was wondering whether <coughs> you were far enough along in development that you'd found anything that you'd wanted to incorporate and couldn't or that was proving to be a real sort of sticking point in terms of getting it right. Uh, not, <coughs> not yet. I mean, we're we've been prototyping... Uh, designing and prototyping various aspects of the game for a year. Uh, that that video we just saw was the result of about a week, a week and a half's work. Uh, we've got another year of development, and we want to we want to get as far as possible with the representations. And <coughs> some of it, the advantage of doing it within a game is that I think even you know, unlike films and books, you get a it's, it's it's a vis it's you get a direct experience you get to perform actions if you make a 
if if you create a world and a character that's compelling um you can embody a character in a way that film and books can't um with things like the, with the playstation rumble and uh, movement controller there's probably other aspects even the speaker in the in the pad there's probably other things that we can do to try and give a sense of the what it what it could be like we'll never obviously we'll never replicate it um exactly and we don't think we ever will but i think that just having an inkling of what it what it f what it might be like is is uh, something that makes this game interesting but also more compelling i think mm.